This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Utopia of Usurers by G. K. Chesterton Section 1 A Song of Swords a drove of cattle came into a village called Swords, and was stopped by the rioters. From the Daily Paper In the place called Swords on the Irish road, it's told for a new renown, how we held the horns of the cattle, and how we will hold the horns of the devil now, ere the lord of hell with the horn on his brow is crowned in Dublin town. Light in the east, and light in the west, and light on the cruel lords, on the souls that suddenly all men knew, and the green flag flew and the red flag flew, and many a wheel of the world stopped too, when the cattle were stopped at swords. Be they sinners or less than saints that smite in the street for rage, we know where the shame shines bright, we know that you they smite at, you their foe. Lords of the lawless wage and low, this is your lawful wage. You pinched a child to a torture price that you dared not name in words. So black a jest was the silver bit that your own speech shook for the shame of it. And the coward was plain as a cow they hit when the cattle had strayed at swords. The wheel of the torrent of wives went round to break men's brotherhood. You gave the good Irish blood to grease the clubs of your country's enemies. You saw the brave man beat to the knees and you saw that it was good. The rope of the rich is long and long, the longest of the hangman's cords, but the kings and crowds are holding their breath in a giant shadow or all beneath, where God stands holding the scales of death between the cattle and swords. Haply the lords that hire and lend, the lowest of all men's lords, who sell their kind like kind at a fair, will find no head of their cattle there, but faces of men where cattle were, faces of men and swords. Utopia of Usurers Part One: Art and Advertisement I propose, subject to the patience of the reader, to devote two or three articles to prophecy. Like all healthy-minded prophets, sacred and profane, I can only prophesy when I am in a rage, and think things look ugly for everybody. And, like all healthy-minded prophets, I prophesy in the hope that my prophecy may not come true. For the prediction made by the truth soothsayer is like the warning given by a good doctor. And the doctor has really triumphed when the patient he condemned to death has revived to life. The threat is justified at the very moment when it is falsified. Now I have said again and again, and I shall continue to say again and again on all the most inappropriate occasions, that we must hit capitalism and hit it hard, for the plain and definite reason that it is growing stronger. Most of the excuses which serve the capitalists as masks are, of course, the excuses of hypocrites. They lie when they claim philanthropy. They no more feel any particular love of men than Albu felt an affection for Chinamen. They lie when they say they have reached the position through their own organizing ability. They generally have to pay men to organize the mine, exactly as they pay men to go down it. They often lie about the present wealth, as they generally lie about their past poverty. But when they say that they are going in for a constructive social policy, they do not lie. They really are going in for a constructive social policy, and we must go in for an equally destructive social policy, and destroy, while it is still half constructed, the accursed thing which they construct. The Example of the Arts Now I propose to take one after another certain aspects and departments of modern life, and describe what I think they will be like in this paradise of plutocrats, this utopia of gold and brass, in which the great story of England seems so likely to end. 
I propose to say what I think our new masters, the mere millionaires, will do with certain human interests and institutions such as art, science, jurisprudence, or religion, unless we strike soon enough to prevent them. And for the sake of argument I will take in this article the example of the arts. Most people have seen a picture called Bubbles, which is used for the advertisement of a celebrated soap, a small cake of which is introduced into the pictorial design. And anybody with an instinct for design, the characterist of the Daily Herald, for instance, will guess that it was not originally a part of the design. He will see that the cake of soap destroys the picture as a picture, as much as the cake of soap had been used to scrub off the paint. Small as it is, it breaks and confuses the whole balance of objects in the composition. I offer no judgment here upon Millet's action in the matter. In fact, I do not know what it was. The important point for me at the moment is that the picture was not painted for the soap, but the soap added to the picture, and the spirit of the corrupting change which has separated us from that Victorian epoch can best be seen in this, that the Victorian atmosphere, with all its faults, did not permit such a style of patronage to pass as a matter of course. Michelangelo may have been proud to have helped an emperor or a pope, though indeed I think he was prouder than they were on his own account. I do not believe Sir John Millais was proud of having helped a soap boiler. I do not say he thought it wrong, but he was not proud of it, and that marks precisely the change from this time to our own. Our merchants have really adopted the style of the merchant princes. They have begun openly to dominate the civilization of the state, as the emperors and popes openly dominated in Italy. In Millais's time, broadly speaking, art was supposed to mean good art. Advertisement was supposed to mean inferior art. The head of a black man painted to advertise somebody's blacking could be a rough symbol, like an insign. The black man had only to be black enough. An artist exhibiting the picture of a negro was expected to know that a black man is not so black as he is painted. He was expected to render a thousand tints of gray and brown and violet, for there is no such thing as a black man, just as there is no such thing as a white man. A fairly clear line separated advertisement from art. The First Effect I should say the first effect of the triumph of the capitalist, if we allow him to triumph, will be that line of demarcation will entirely disappear. There will be no art that might not just as well be advertisement. I do not necessarily mean that there will be no good art. Much of it might be, much of it already is, very good art. You may put it, if you please, in the form that there has been a vast improvement in advertisements. Certainly there would be nothing surprising if the head of a negro advertising somebody's blacking nowadays were finished with as careful and subtle colors as one of the old and superstitious painters would have wasted on the negro king who brought the gifts to christ but the improvement of advertisements is the degradation of artists it is their degradation for this clear and vital reason that the artist will work not only to please the rich but only to increase their riches which is a considerable step lower. After all, it was as a human being that a pope took pleasure in a cartoon of Raphael or a prince took pleasure in a statuette of Cellini. The prince paid for the statuette, but he did not expect the statuette to pay him. It is my impression that no cake of soap can be found anywhere in the cartoons which the pope ordered of Raphael and no one who knows the small-minded cynicism of our plutocracy, its secrecy, its gambling spirit, its contempt of conscience, can doubt that the artist advertiser will often be assisting enterprises over which he will have no moral control, and of which he could feel no moral approval. He will be working to spread quack medicines, queer investments, and will work for Marconi instead of Medici and to this base ingenuity he will have to bend the proudest and purest of the virtues of the intellect, the power to attract his brethren, and the noblest duty of praise. For that picture by Millais is a very allegorical picture. 
it is almost a prophecy of what uses are awaiting the beauty of the child unborn the praise will be of a kind that may correctly be called soap and the enterprises of a kind that may truly be described as bubbles part two letters and the new laureates in these articles i can only take two or three examples of the first and fundamental fact of our time i mean the fact that the capitalists of our community are becoming quite openly the kings of it in my last and first article i took the case of art and advertisement i pointed out that art must be growing worse merely because advertisement is growing better in those days Millais condescended to peer soap in these days i really think it would be Pierce who condescends to Millais. but here i turn to an art i know more about that of journalism only in my ease the art verges on artlessness the great difficulty with the english lies in the absence of something one may call democratic imagination we find it easy to realize an individual but very hard to realize that the great masses consist of individuals our system has been aristocratic in the special sense of there being only a few actors on the stage and the back scene is kept quite dark though it is really a throng of faces home rule tended to be not so much the irish as the grand old man the boer war tended to be not so much south africa as simply joe and it is the amusing but distressing fact that every class of political leadership as it comes to the front in its turn catches the rays of this isolating limelight and becomes a small aristocracy certainly no one has the aristocratic complaint so badly as the labor party at the recent congress the real difference between larkin and the english labor leaders was not so much in anything right or wrong in what he said as in something elemental and even mystical in the way he suggested a mob but it must be plain even to those who agree with a more official policy that for mr havelock wilson the principal question was mr havelock wilson and that mr sexton was mainly considering the dignity and fine feelings of mr sexton you may say they were as sensitive as aristocrats or as sulky as babies the point is that the feeling was personal but larkin like danton not only talks like ten thousand men talking but he also has some of the carelessness of the colossus of arsis a dance of degradation it is needless to say that this respecting of persons has led all the other parties a dance of degradation we ruin south africa because it would be a slight on lord gladstone to save south africa we have a bad army because it would be a snub to lord haldane to have a good army and no tory is allowed to say marconi for fear mr george should say canuck but this curious personal element with its appalling lack of patriotism has appeared in a new and curious form in other departments of life the department of literature especially periodical literature and the form it takes is in the next example i shall give of the way in which the capitalists are now appearing more and more openly as the masters and princes of the community i will take a victorian instance to mark the change as i did in the case of advertisement of bubbles it was said in my childhood by the more apoplectic and elderly sort of tory that w e gladstone was only a free trader because he had a partnership in gilby's foreign wines this was no doubt nonsense but it had a dim symbolic or mainly prophetic truth in it it was true to some extent even then and it has been increasingly true since that the statesman was often an ally of the salesman and represented not only a nation of shopkeepers but one particular shop but in gladstone's time even if this was true it was never the whole truth and no one would have endured it as being admitted truth the politician was not solely an eloquent and persuasive bagman traveling for certain businessmen he was bound to mix even his corruption with some intelligible deals and rules of policy and the proof of it is this that at least it was the statesman who bulked large in the public eye and his financial backer was entirely in the background 
old gentlemen might choke over their port with the moral certainty that the prime minister had shares in wine merchants but the old gentleman would have died on the spot if the wine merchant had really been made as important as the prime minister if it had been sir walter gilby whom disraeli denounced or punch caricatured if sir walter gilby's favourite collars with the design of which i am unacquainted had grown as large as the wings of an archangel if sir walter gilby had been credited with successfully eliminating the british oak with his little hatchet if near the temple and the courts of justice our sight was struck by a majestic statue of a wine merchant or if the earnest conservative lady who threw a gingerbread nut at the premier had directed it toward the wine merchant instead the shock to victorian england would have been very great indeed halos for employers now something very like that is happening the mere wealthy employer is beginning to have not only the power but some of the glory i have seen in several magazines lately and magazines of a high class the appearance of a new kind of article literary men are being employed to praise a big business man personally as men used to praise a king they not only find political reasons for the commercial schemes that they have done for some time past they also find moral defences for the commercial schemers they describe the capitalist brain of steel and heart of gold in a way that englishmen hitherto have been at least in the habit of reserving for romantic figures like garibaldi or gordon in one excellent magazine mr t p o'connor who when he likes can write on letters like a man of letters has some purple pages of praise of sir joseph lyons the man who runs those tea-shop places he incidentally brought in a delightful passage about the beautiful souls possessed by some people called Selman and Gluckstein. I think I like best the passage where he said that Lyons' charming social accomplishments included a talent for imitating a Jew. The article is accompanied with a large and somewhat leering portrait of that shopkeeper which makes the parlour trick in question particularly astonishing another literary man who certainly ought to know better wrote in another paper a piece of hero worship about mr selfridge no doubt the fashion will spread and the art of words as polished and pointed by ruskin or meredith will be perfected yet further to explore the labyrinthine heart of herod or compare the simple stoicism of marshall with the saintly charm of snellgrove any man can be praised and rightly praised if he only stands on two legs he does something a cow cannot do if a rich man can manage to stand on two legs for a reasonable time it is called self-control if he has only one leg it is called with some truth self-sacrifice i could say something nice and true about every man i have ever met therefore i do not doubt i could find something nice about lyons or selfridge if i searched for it but i shall not the nearest postman or cabman will provide me with just the same brain of steel and heart of gold as these unlucky lucky men but i do resent the whole age of patronage being revived under such absurd patrons and all poets becoming court poets under kings that have taken no oath nor led us into any battle end of section one